Hey, good afternoon, everybody. All right, well, welcome to week three. So we are flying through this quarter, just like winter. So my, um, my plan for today is to talk a little bit about PA1, which, which looked really good. Um, talk about PA2, um, which I posted over the weekend. Um, talk about your current ODP that's, that opened up this morning. Um, and then um, talk about more scanners, hash maps, and some of the things that you'll be using in PA2 and so on and so forth. Um, but any questions before we start all of that? Okay. So, um, I don't know if we're supposed to get rid of, like, uh, punctuation. Yes, you are. Scanners, you, use a delimiter. Um, you ignore all punctuation. Yeah, is, is, is there a way to get rid of white spaces using the delimiter? So the default behavior for scanner for the next method is to take things separated by white space, which is exactly the behavior you want for PA2. So you're going to read in tokens or words. You're going to scrub them to get rid of everything that's not a letter. And then you're going to convert everything to uppercase. And we'll go through details of that in a little bit. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. For some reason, I always get a file not found exception with uh, uh, giving it a file. Hmm. Even if I give it the absolute total path. Are you doing a uh, new scanner, parentheses, new file, parentheses, path name? Yep. Interesting. What, uh, what operating system are you on? Right now I'm on Windows. I was about to try it on, uh, <clears throat> try it on uh, Linux, like WSL machine. So Windows has, you know, the funny backslash problem, and backslashes usually need to be escaped with a backslash. So you... Make sure you use double backslashes in the path. I, I went ahead and poked around with it uh, and in a debugger, and I can see that even if you do use the right slashes, it will autocorrect it for you. Mm -hmm. um, and also Windows even nowadays lets you do forward slashes if you mm -hmm. want, so it wouldn't cause a problem either way. But okay. And have you, tried, have you tried a... Um, just a file name in the current directory you're running in without any uh, any other path? I found that that causes errors and uh, you need to get the absolute path. So you, uh, in the system, there's a get property, uh, user.dir to get the full directory. And it does get the, the full absolute path every time. But for some reason, every time I hand that file off to the scanner, it automatically gives me if I am that found exception when it's the absolute and true path of the file I want to open. So I would say there's there might be something a little wonky going on with your version of Java that you're running. Maybe the environment it's running in or the operating system or something because this should be pretty pretty much a slam dunk that you just open a file with the path name or the name of a file. You pass that file to the constructor for scanner and you should be able to ingest. I may not have the same version of the JDK on my main machine and not the WSL. Okay. So you're probably right. WSL is is getting better, um, but but even as recently as winter quarter, I had students um, reporting strange behaviors from uh, from WSL that didn't show up under a regular Linux system. It should be JDK 1.8 if that's what you have, Corbin. Right, but I think on my main machine, not the WSL client. It's it's. I think it might be a different uh, Java version. It's a while since I've installed it. Okay. So that may be the case. Yeah, let me know, and and you're welcome to send me a, a code snippet that um that is not finding the file. I can see if there's anything that sort of jumps out to me there. Um. 
but it sounds like you're probably doing the right thing and there's some there's some other issue going on. I got a quick question from PA1B. Okay. Um, you'd made a comment regarding the tri-catch um, of trying to do it around the smallest amount of code possible. Mm -hmm. So I did it around my if-else statement because I figured that's where I would catch an exception, but um, what would you suggest? Well, I must have missed that part in the class. So you can do something like try num equals integer dot parse int. Oh, I'm not seeing your screen if you're... Actually, you are, but my screen is not seeing my writing. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, okay. like, I hear you writing something, but I, I don't know what. I set this up ahead of time so that it would be all set, but sometimes the camera times out. Gotcha. So let's try this again. Hey, video. Oh, there you go. Right? So this is the only statement that could cause a problem, right? The integer dot parse int on the string. So put that in the try catch block. And the only small trick is, you know, make sure the thing that you're saving it into is declared outside of that try statement. If it's declared inside here, then it disappears once you leave the try block. But declare it up there, do this. If something goes wrong, you know, print your message and go back to the top of your while loop. Otherwise, down here, now you can check to see if you're in stack or queue mode and, and push or add appropriately. Okay. Now, what's the, what's the drawback to doing it the way that I did it, which is around the whole thing? Um, it, it, can, it can get a little sloppy. Um, if, if some error occurs because of something else that's going on, um, you won't know it, right? It'll just drop you into the catch block, and it may, it may hide some other issue. Um, and for maintenance, it, it becomes troublesome if, you know, there's a big long block of code in there and, um, you know, somebody wants to do something with it while well, you can't break it up unless you know which parts need to be in the try block, which parts can come out and so on. It's something that's, that's just kind of discouraged usually. Um, okay. it's not a big deal, but, but I saw a few submissions where it looked like the block was getting bigger than it needed to be. And so I just wanted to kind of like put that out there to um, try to keep it tight. So just over that parse basically would have been just as sufficient as the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Funny enough, I just went ahead and put it in a try catch block. And yeah. And now it will compile. And it actually works the way it's supposed to. So it's like if I'm not covering the, the file that found exception, even if the file does exist and it does pick it up, if I don't put it in the try catch block, it won't compile. That's interesting. Right, yeah, you've got, you've got to handle the exception or say that the method that you're in can throw an exception. Otherwise, you, you won't even be able to compile. That's fascinating. Now, there's some exceptions you don't have to do that for. Um, like an array out of bounds exception. If that happens, you'll throw an exception. Do not require to catch that. But most of these classes, um, if the method can throw an error, you need to have a try catch block. Interesting. I've never seen a language that enforces things like that. <laughs> yeah, Java has some some things about it. I mean, it was it was partially intended to um, address safety concerns of software because so many so many um, exploits were coming out, and you know stuff was going on the web, and code was poorly written. And there were memory leaks and buffer overrun potentials and all kinds of things, and we um, we started seeing you know this this huge cost of software being exploited and so part of Java's idea was um, you know get rid of pointers and and you know allow a closing off of things and and this is something that Android you know every app you run in Android runs in its own sandbox um, same kind of idea still kind of the concern today with languages like C and C++ and mm -hmm. It's interesting to go read the history of Java and C Sharp and some other languages like it. Mm -hmm. um, how 
people even try to make C++ a managed language before uh, Java and C Sharp came along to yeah. make it so that you don't have to directly address pointers at that security. Mm -hmm. And how many people here are familiar with the language Ada? Never heard of it. Wow. <laughs> so this is this is the ultimate. Yeah, it's named after Ada Lovelace. She was the first programmer, and this was going to be the last programming language. How's that for arrogance? <laughs> so, so the idea was, you know, there were all these different. This was in the '80s. There were all these languages, and people were discovering, you know, structured programming, and things like that. Um, and the government decided we're going to design the ultimate programming language because the government's really good at you know taking on large tasks like that, right? Um, and so they they developed this language called um, Ada, and it was developed by committee, and it was partially you know everybody's favorite features thrown into one one big melting pot, and the thing was a monster, right? It it would barely uh, run the compiler would barely run on any machine and if it ran on your machine it would you know bring it to its knees and so um, the government had you know a mechanism by which you could get an exemption from the requirement to use ADA for all of your computer related programming and everybody started getting exemptions because there was no way to run this thing you know and so it just kind of died a quiet death I think it's still around but it's it's definitely not something that's taken over Sounds like something from the 80s. I remember the yeah. early, uh, early Microsoft, uh, apparently IBM wanted uh, their software to have as many lines of code as possible. Mm. Microsoft was saying, like, no, this, less is better. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, let's see. Um, so checking to see if an input symbol is a question mark. So this is this is exactly like in in uh, PA one A. So if your input string is in a variable called string, for example, you can say if string dot equals double quote question mark, and that statement should be true if the input is exactly just that question mark. Somebody pointed out to me that ODP 300 was listed as being worth 10 points. And so if you got 100, you got like, you know, 90 bonus points. So I fixed that, um, and it's back to a 100-point assignment. So thanks for the heads up. Oh, are you going to let that stand, or were you going to fix that? The 10-point, 100-point? Yeah. I just fixed it. Yeah, that was a typo. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure when everybody got 140 percent, we would have probably uh, caught that up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Um, so PA one B, not much to say except nice work. Um, this this was in the end a really kind of ambitious project because. If you don't know Java before the class, right, you're creating two classes, you're putting methods in there, you're writing constructors, and you're um, using them in, in a main program to demonstrate their behavior, you're parsing input, all this kind of stuff. It's a lot of parts and pieces, um, but people did really well on this. And so, you know, hopefully PA1A was a good setup for that, but still the conversion into Java and an object-oriented implementation is is not a slam dunk, so... Very, uh, very happy that people were able to do this. So lots of hundreds on the, um, on the assignment. Um, a few gotchas here and there where people, uh, you know, swap the behavior of stacks and queues with each other. Or, um, didn't have any comments, didn't have their name in the code, things like that. Um, but nothing, nothing, nothing serious, um, 
nothing that concerns me long term. So I posted feedback, even if you got a perfect score, you might have some feedback. One of the things I commented is, um, you know, so your stack is actually implemented as a linked list. So inside your my stack class, you probably had a declaration like this. And since stack is a linked list, it has a two string method, the two string method of the linked list. And so when I asked you to make a two string method in your my stack, so this is your class my stack. Um, there's still a few people who iterated through each element of the linked list, built a string containing each element separated by commas and so on and so forth. Don't have to do that. You can do that, it works, you get full points for it, but really your two string method could simply say one line, just return stack dot two string. And the two string method of a linked list returns, guess what, a pair of square brackets with a comma separated list of elements in between, which was exactly the required format. And if you prefer Instead of calling the two string method, you could just return stack plus and just add an empty string to the end. No space, nothing. Just a string which compels the JVM to call this thing's two string method appended to an empty string. This will be exactly the same as that. And so you'll see this notation sometimes, or it doesn't matter which end you append an empty line to, you end up with the same thing. Uh, let's see what else. We talked about try-catch blocks already, keeping them as small as possible. Um, tar files, if um, if your tar file is, is corrupted, or if you build your tar file incorrectly, you can corrupt your Java files, and you don't necessarily get an indication that that happened. Um, Linux will do what you ask it to do, and even if it's something very different from what you intended, if it's not an error to Linux, you may not know. So there's there's this recommendation I keep making, which is after you upload, say, a tar file to Canvas, pull it back down, go into an empty directory, untar it, recompile everything, run your test cases, make sure it all works. This catches, you know, files that were corrupted, um, a tar file that didn't get uploaded all the way because something went wrong with a transfer. Um, you were in the wrong directory and uploaded an old version of your files. You added your name to the file at the last minute and you used a single slash instead of two slashes. All of this stuff you can catch by doing this kind of like final, final closing the loop, right? Pull things back down. Repeat the experience that I'm going to have when I go to grade your assignment, basically which is to pull down the tar file, untar it in an empty directory, compile, run a bunch of test cases. The other thing is is just this reminder that things like toString should almost never print anything. So you call the toString method to get back a string that that represents your object in some way. For a rectangle, you want to get back a string that says, you know, it's a 3 by 5 rectangle or whatever. But um, you rarely want your your um, two-string method to print anything. That would be a very kind of unusual use because when somebody tries to concatenate an object to another string, they don't really expect something to be printed to standard out, right? This would be like, you know, if you called the sign function and some message appeared on your screen telling you what the sign of the angle was that you were calculating. Well, that's great if that's what you want to have happen, but in general, if you're calculating the sign of a number, you just want to take that and store it in a variable or see if it's zero or something like that. So usually things are going to work silent. All of the methods that you're going to write for PA2 should be silent. None of them should produce any output. And so that's, that's something to keep in mind. All right. Any other any other questions, comments on on uh, PA one B?
All right, let's talk about the next ODP. So I opened this one up on Tuesday. So this time you have two days to work on it. Um, but the Monday, Wednesday class has a day to work on it before coming into class. So let's take a look at this. So read me 303. So this is this is um, kind of like a hello world for um, arrays and for setters and getters. So you're creating a class called a class, very innovative name. Um, and um, the idea is you'll you'll construct the class, and inside the constructor, it initializes an array of ten integers and sets each integer equal to one. All right, so there's going to be, um, just like, you know, in your stack class, there is a, a kind of global variable named stack that's accessible throughout the whole class. You're going to have a, um, a variable that's an array named data. And it's going to be an array of 10 integers. Um, you can call it whatever you want. I use data in the example. It's an array of 10 integers. And in the constructor, all 10 of those elements get initialized to 1. And then you have two methods in the class. There's a set method, which takes two arguments, an index and a value, and it basically sets element index equal to the value. And then there's a get method, and it basically returns the value of element index, whatever index is. And so I put a little blurb in the top of the readme that basically shows you everything you need to know about arrays. Declare an array like this an array of integers, int, bracket, bracket, space, name of the variable. That's a declaration. It's kind of like int star in, uh, in C. And then before you can use this array, you need to actually construct it. You need to allocate space for it. And that's where you tell the system how big the array is. So you can say data equals new int bracket and give it a number, in this case 10. And that creates an array of 10 elements. All right, and then here's here's an example. Um, you can make it private. I don't think I test for that. But the idea is we have setters and getters, so it could be completely private. And so here's a sample main program you can use to help test whether your A class is working correctly or not. So I construct a new A class. And if I were to say, you know, get any element from 0 to 9, it should return a 1, because that should be the initial value. And then here I'm setting element 5 to 17, and I'm setting element 8 to 12. And so here I get element 5, I should see 17. Here I get element 8, I should see a 12. And if I get any other element, 0 through 9, I should get a 1. So that's just, just um, playing with classes and um, introducing arrays and then um, making a accessor and mutator. Once you're confident your class is correct, right, compile it and then assess using this command. All right, questions about that? I knew some people would be doing it already. Awesome. Got some 10 out of 10s. All right. Um, let's... Let's play with arrays for a minute. And you don't need to do anything with arrays for PA2. But let's play with them anyway.
And we've been doing arrays, right? This this args that we get to our main method is an array of strings. So we have we have actually dealt with these before, but perhaps not constructed them. So so let's make an example. Um, string um, data. This is an array of strings. Um, data equals new string bracket ten. So we can we can do a few things with strings that we couldn't do in C. One is we can figure out the length. Um, So we can say data dot length, and again, there's no parentheses here. We're not calling a method. We're calling a property of this this array, um, and the property named length tells us how many things are in that array. In this case, it should come back with ten, um, and if we do something like uh, data bracket five. Let's print out the contents of data bracket five um, inside square brackets. And we have not initialized this yet, right? But, um, but let's see what it does anyway. I can open my camera, I'm done eating lunch. Um, Right, so we run this, and the length of the data is equal to 10, which we expected. Um, data bracket 5 equals null. So, so when you construct an array of strings, this new is creating something like this. Something like data. And each of these things are going to be strings, but those strings themselves don't exist yet. Each of these is actually null. We did something like this in, in 2.22 when we created an array of structures. We could malloc space for the array itself, which contained, you know, a bunch of pointers. But then those pointers were typically pointing to null, and if we tried to use them, we would seg fault. So after initializing the array of pointers, we needed to initialize the thing that each pointer was pointing to. So it's kind of a two-step initialization. Well, same thing happens inside um, Java. We construct the array itself. That makes you know an array a placeholder for 10 uh, strings, but those strings themselves don't exist. They need to be constructed. So we can do something like, you know, data bracket 5 equals hello. And then if we print element 5 again, we should see that string in there. <clears throat> so this is fairly obvious with strings, because if you just declare a string, you don't expect it to have a value. But with, with other um, types of objects, with rectangles, for example, we could make an array of rectangles by saying new rectangle bracket 10, but then to actually use one of those rectangles, we need to say, you know, data bracket zero equals new rectangle and give it a height and a width and so on. But, but all of this is, is above and beyond what you need for ODP 303. But we'll, we'll be dealing with arrays of objects in definitely in PA four and five possibly in PA3. Is there like um, is there like an object for a basic list or a vector? Um so there's there's things called collections and and collections are usually extended into to other things like linked lists and so on. Um,
So yeah, collections are, are kind of a base class for all of these other things, including vectors, which may be what you're talking about, and also um, array lists. They're not the same thing? Vectors and array lists? Yeah, where it's like you have a chunk size and you keep allocating more objects as you go. Oh, there's, there's so many flavors of all of this stuff, though, that everybody's got their own. We've got like two different types of hash maps, for example, um, that we'll talk about. So, um, so array list is not synchronized. Let's see if vector is. Um, I believe vector is. So, so one thing that happens is is um, we're going to talk about multiprocessing later in this course, and and one of the issues that comes up is if you have shared data, um, what happens if two people try to access it at the same time? So, imagine you have a linked list, right? And so you've got some kind of of chain of nodes. And suppose that that you're in the process of trying to print the contents of the linked list. So you start here and you print that node and you go over to this one and you print that node and at the same time somebody else comes in and deletes this node from the linked list. And you've already noted what this node is pointing to and now when you try to go to that node that's a spot of memory that's been reclaimed and you either seg fault or you know maybe you print something there but the thing that it points to is you know somewhere off in in the universe um, and so so a lot of these classes come in different flavors depending on whether or not they're susceptible to this kind of of corruption um, and so there's there's a concept of thread safety if you have multiple threads or multiple processes interacting with something from this class can you get into trouble with it it's pretty easy to make things thread safe but it's expensive and so if you don't need that you may opt for for a uh, less um, endowed class that doesn't have the thread safety features and so that seems like one difference between vectors and array lists um, array lists warn you that this is not synchronized which means it's not thread safe Yeah, it's fun, right? Uh, oh yeah. Uh, I posted, I posted a project I worked on where I made a multi-threaded prime numbers calculator. Oh yeah, yeah. Number of like th threads to work on calculating uh, prime numbers, and when I first did it, I, I ran into the fact that all these threads were fighting over the same list of found primes and trying to sort them and count. Mm -hmm. them. Oh yeah. <laughs> with sockets. Mhm. Mm yeah, and this is this is fun because as it sounds like you discovered, um, you can have a problem in the code and not know it. Sometimes for a long time, and sometimes you don't know it until you've got you know a hundred thousand people hitting your code simultaneously, and now the deadlocks and the live locks and the synchronization issues suddenly come out in in living color. And um, the things that, that you wrote very carefully and you tested, you know, by running it from two different machines at the same time, looked like they were great, but in fact there's issues there. And um, when you get enough concurrency, sometimes those, those come blazing out. And we'll talk about all of that and... and um, look at ways that these things can happen and ways to analyze them and, and how to um, theoretically avoid at least some of these. Um, that'll be later in the course. All right, uh, let's see. So let's talk about PA2. And um, this posted on Sunday, I think, and I extended the deadline so that it's not due until Monday morning at 8, because I wanted to make sure we had, you know, two class meetings and then you've got some time after that to work on it. Um, 
So this this is an unusual um, deadline. So it's Monday morning at eight. Most of the other assignments will still be Friday mornings at eight. Um, and so let's see what we got here. This is this is a long document. It's like a seven page write up um, because I'm trying to put a lot of detail in here. We're going to talk about a lot of detail in here. But at its core, this is a fairly simple behavior that you're after with this with this program. Um, and the implementation of it is actually going to be fairly simple also. But kind of like P8 1B, there's, there's a lot of, of details to pin down just right. Um, but here's, here's the basic goal. Um, we're, we're trying to create a word index. So, um, you know, if you pick up a textbook and you open it in the back, you see an index. It's a list of words, and next to each word is one or more uh, page numbers where that word appeared. So, you know, if you're, if you're doing physics homework and there's a question about momentum and you haven't come to class or read the book, you open the physics book, you look up momentum. Right, and you see 500 different pages it appeared on, so you start reading those. Um, so we're going to create something that can create a, a word index on an arbitrary file. And and one difference right up front is, you know, our files don't have pages. So we're not going to tell you what page you found this word on. What we're going to do is just sort of number the words in the file and tell you what position the word was in. So suppose you have an input file that says... Um, this is a test, 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 it is done, this is all. And for now, all my, all my words are uppercase and there's no punctuation and so on. All right, so we're going to think of breaking this input into words. And we're going to start counting words from the number one. So this is going to be word one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. All right. So you're going to to write a method named process file that you're going to feed this file to, and it's going to do what we just did. It's going to think of this as a bunch of words. It's going to count up how many words there are in the whole file and now it's going to make a list it's going to say hey I see the word this and I see the word is a uh, test done and all and the word this occurs at positions 1 and 10 is occurs at positions 2 and 11 I missed it uh, occurs at position 3 Test was at position 4, 5, and 6. Done was at position 9. Um, all was at position 12. It was at position 7. I might have missed a few, but that's, that's okay. So it's building in its memory this, this information, right? What are all the words that I found, and where did those words occur? All right, that's, that's the intended behavior of the code you're going to write. The way you're going to do it is by using hashes and linked lists. So hashes, remember, are ways that we can, we can take anything, a string, a, a picture, whatever, we're going to use strings, and we can associate something with it. And in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to take strings that represent words and we're going to associate with each word a linked list of integers and this linked list will contain all the locations where that word appeared in the input file so in our hash this is the key and this is the value so it's a key value pair And the main goal of your main method, which is called process file, will be to create this hash table containing these pairs of information. And then you're going to write a few methods to say, you know, um, tell me how many times test appeared in the file. Tell me how many unique words were in the file. Tell me what the second or third 
or first occurrence of the word test is. Yeah, this is going to be fun with generics. <laughs> so our, our main goal is, is building this hash table. And you're going to do it one word at a time. So you're going to read your file in using a scanner. We'll talk about how to do that. Um, you're going to condition it, so you're going to make all the words uppercase. You're going to get rid of any punctuation you see. So if it's this comma, you're going to toss the comma. You're just going to use this. So we're going to change things to uppercase, clean up the words. And then, basically, starting with an empty hash table. So here's the hash table you're going to build. There's the key value pairs. You're going to take the first word, this, and you're going to say, do I have this in my hash table? If you don't, you're going to put the word this in along with an empty linked list. And then you're going to take the word number and append that to the end of the linked list. Then you're going to read the second word from your file. It's an is. There's no is in here. You're going to add is, make an empty linked list, add the word number, which is 2. Here's the word a. That's a new key. You're going to add that with an empty linked list and then append the position number 3 to the end of the list. And here's the word test. You're going to add that to your hash table, put an empty link list, and append the number four to the end. The next word that you read is going to be the word test. And so again, you're going to check your hash and say, do I have the word test? In this case, the answer is yes. Test is already in my hash table, which means there is a link list associated to it. So I'm going to take this link list and I'm going to append the word number five to the end of it. And then I get the next word test, and I look in my hash table, and hey, it's already in there. I have a linked list. I'm going to take the word position 6 and append that to the end of the linked list. And you're going to keep doing that until you run out of words, and then your, your file has been processed. How, um, do you have to worry about special characters like commas, half tags, so, so on and so forth? So what you're going to do while you're reading in your file is if it looks something like this, hello, comma, can you hear me? So we're going to use the next method from Scanner, which will read in what they call a token at a time. It's stuff separated by spaces. So your first token is going to be hello, comma. You're going to write a method called cleanup word, and cleanup word is going to do the following. It's going to go through your input, and anything that is a letter, it's going to convert it to uppercase and keep it. Here's an E that's a letter, it's going to keep that. Here's a pair of L's, it's going to keep those. Here's an O, it's going to keep that. Here's a comma, which is not a letter, it's going to ignore that. So it's going to change this word to hello. And can will become can, and this will become you, and this will become here. And me, question mark, will become an M and an E, and the question mark will get tossed. So you're, you're going to write a method that will take whatever your input is, including punctuation, numbers, weird characters, and turn it into this nice, clean thing of uppercase words containing only letters with each word separated by a space or multiple spaces. All right, other questions on, on kind of this, this high-level goal? We haven't talked about the code yet. We haven't talked about, about the details, but sort of the high-level notion of building up a word index. Does that make sense so far? So basically, uh, the, the key is it's like a hash map, but our link list is going to be a link list of integers, and it's just going to be location numbers. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Yep. Sure. So we got a string, we've got a linked list of integers, and those are associated because they're inside this hash map. All right, so let's look at the, the long and wordy details from April 17th, 2022. Um, so you're going to implement a new Java class named indexer, uppercase I. Um, and it will basically do what we just described, let you read the contents of a text file and create an index showing the location of each word. Um, right up front, let me stress this thing that I've, I've said with other assignments. The amount of code you need to write 
for this assignment is relatively small. It's, it's potentially a complex task, and the behavior is certainly fairly sophisticated, but the actual amount of code is, is pretty small. In fact, the code that cleans up the word is probably the most complex piece of the whole process. And that's really just a for loop and an if statement and a concatenation to a string. Um, oh, someone asked, what about the word don't? So if it says don't, again, you're going to take your word character by character. If it's a letter, convert it to uppercase, append it to a string. Here's an O, convert it to uppercase. Here's an N, convert it to uppercase. Here's a quotation mark, not a letter, don't do anything with it. Here's a T, append that to a, your string in uppercase. So D-O-N apostrophe, apostrophe T gets converted to don't. So we're just tossing out the punctuation. Just get a big eraser and scratch out all of the punctuation and, um, and you're good. All right, so, so um, my solution to this was about 80 some lines and, and about half of that was white space comments or just you know lines with a bracket on it. So, so 40, 50 lines of code will, will get you a complete solution to this. If you're thinking smart, which means thinking lazy, right? Um, just like in PA1B, um, we're going to lean on the fact that the things we're working with, the strings, the linked lists, the hash maps, are classes, right? And these objects have methods that will do a lot of the things we want to do. For example, if I find a new word, um, let, let's say I find a word test, right? How do I know if there's an entry in my hash map with the word test? Well, there's, there's a method in the hash map class called get. And I can say, you know, get the entry for a test. And if it returns null, test is not in there. If test is in there, it will return the value, which is what? A linked list. Linked lists come with a method called add, which will add something to the end of the linked list. So in one line, right, I could do, you know, hash map dot get this word dot add this position number. And it will do this whole business of looking for this. And if it finds it, go ahead and take the linked list, append something to the end. So if you find yourself writing lots of loops, doing lots of iteration, um, implementing a linked list, following things from node to node, stuff like that, take a step back and and take another look at the documentation for the classes you're working with and chances are you'll find there's there's a way to already do what you're trying to do this is like the two string method right you can iterate and build up the string yourself but since a two string um, for linked list does what we want if we had a stack that was a linked list we could just return stack dot two string so that that kind of idea is going to be key to this assignment um, so start early, as usual. Yeah, go ahead. Is there a method in the string class for checking if it's a letter or not? Mm-hmm. There's actually a static method in um, the character class called um, character.isLetter. And you can give it a letter and it'll return a Boolean. Oh, maybe I should redo this first. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll get there eventually. <laughs> I'm, I'm starting off yeah, slowly here. And string has a two upper case that you can use to convert case. Yeah. All right, so so strategize before you start coding too much. Write some code to test things out, right? But before you start writing what you think is going to be, you know, the actual the actual indexer class or the actual process file method or something like that, make sure you've got a good idea how you're going to do this. And build it up in pieces. And, and test it as you go, and make sure you understand what you're doing as you go. And it's, it's an assignment that, for many people, exposes kind of the joy of object-oriented programming. Because you just sort of grab these things and put them together, and bingo, here you go, you know. Here's my glorious indexer. Um, so fundamental challenge, right, thinking about objects as self-contained entities. If you have a linked list, you also have the methods that go along with that linked list. So how do you add to the end of a linked list called blah? Just say blah.add. How do you see how many things are in the linked list named blah? Blah.size, right? All right, 
Again, for this assignment, stick to the command line. Don't use Eclipse, IntelliJ, Visual Studio, things like that. Command line, Java C to compile, Java to run. It's worth it. It will help you on the exams, right? Because if you can, if you can write code in a simple editor like VI, you can write code on paper, right? If you got something that's that's auto completing for you or or reminding you of syntax or something like that, then when you get to the exam, you're going to have to study and practice and hope that you remember things or write really good notes or things like that. So stick to the command line for now, right? PA four and five will definitely be using Eclipse, um, but for now, um, keep keep it close to the metal. All right. So your class is named Indexer. That's the only thing you're responsible for is this class. Okay, you don't need to submit a main program. If you do, I won't use it. Um, but you'll want to write some main programs to test the class as you're developing it. But the only thing you're submitting is one class named Indexer. And so what you submit won't actually be runnable. That's okay. I'm going to link it up with my own test beds and run it against some test files. And I'll, I've given you a sample um, test file you can use on the server, and we'll talk about that in here too. All right, details, constructor, um, indexer, index equals new indexer. Doesn't really do anything. If there's some initialization that you want to put in here, you can, but there's really nothing that you need to do in this constructor. So you don't even have to write this because there's always a default constructor, but you can write it if you want. All right, public methods. Um, the main big method is called process file. It takes the name of a file and it does all of this. This going through the file, cleaning up the words, building up the hash table. And it does this all silently and in the end, what do you have? You have a hash table inside your object. So just like, you know, in the MyStack class we had a linked list named Stack, you're going to have inside the indexer class a hash table. And the hash table is going to be called index. I think I specify that, um, but it's going to be it's going to be a hash map, and and you're going to build this up as you ingest the file. I'm not going to print anything. I'm not going to do anything that's noticeable from outside, but you're going to return a boolean. If you can open the file, read it in, convert the stuff, build the hash map, count the tallies. And everything works according to plan. This method returns true, means success. If anything goes wrong, it returns false. If you can't open the file, if if there's some weird issue going on, if aliens invade and they outlaw the JVM or something, right? Return false, and it tells the caller, "Hey, something went wrong." But that's all that that you pass back to the caller: true or false, success or failure. Um, so is that something that we could use the try catch for if you catch an exception from a file not opening and just return false? Exactly, exactly. Okay. Yeah, and so this this should never actually throw an exception that that the person using your class would see. So you definitely want to catch anything that could that could fail like that. In particular, you know, if you can't open the file. All right. So it opens the file name, reads its contents using has next and next. That's the pair of, of scanner methods we use for reading one word at a time. While reading, it builds the index. This is important, right? Um, you do not want to read the entire file into one big long string or a big array and then start processing it. I'm going to run this on things like Wuthering Heights and War and Peace, and it'll probably run out of memory if you try to store the whole input file. This should work with an infinitely long input file um, until your linked list get too big. So process it as you're reading it in. Read one word, add it to your hash table, go on to the next word. And that's generally how you want to process information in, in a program if you have the option. Process it as you go. Um, so that, you know, there's, there's not a, a theoretical limit to how much input you can handle because um, you're not saving it in memory. All right, so the method returns true if everything succeeds, false if it fails. Um, once you've built an index, right, once you've got this hash table sitting in memory, now you can go ahead and you can use these other methods. So one is number of instances, takes a word, tells you how many times the word occurs. So if this is my hash table and I say number of instances this, I should get back one, or I should get back two. 
If I say number of instances of test, I should get back three. Uh should give me back one, because it occurred once. Number of instances of bunny should give me back minus one to say, hey, bunny did not appear anywhere in the text. So number of instances takes a word, tells you how many times the word appears. Sorry, zero if it doesn't appear anywhere. So it occurs zero times. Minus one is our flag, right? And if we haven't processed a file successfully, return minus one to say, hey, I can't count the number of times that bunny is in there because I don't have a file to work with. So this is like a flag saying, you know, there's a user error here. You haven't processed a file yet. How can I count the number of times a word appears? Wouldn't you return false? Though? This is number of instances. Yeah, so you'd return false oh, from I'm here. I'm looking at the wrong thing. I'm right. Sorry. Okay, no problem. And yeah, in, in your program, right, if this returns false, you've got no reason to call number of instances. But somebody might do that anyway, right? They might, they might ignore the return value from here and just assume it's going to succeed. So you're kind of giving them a second, a second chance at at um, reality, right? Saying, hey, you know, I can't count that because, you know, you never processed a file. All right, location of takes a word and the instance number and tells you where that occurrence of the word was. So if I say location of this comma uh, zero, I should get back a one. That's the zeroth occurrence of the word this. If I say location of this comma one, I should get back a 10. If I say location of this comma two, I should get back as uh, minus one because there is no, so these, these location numbers are indexed from zero. So this is the zeroth occurrence, the first occurrence. There is no second occurrence, third, fourth, fifth, and so on. And if I ask for location of with a index that's negative, that's also an error, return minus one. So location of test comma zero would be four, test comma one would be five, test comma two would be six. Does it have to be base zero? Or yeah, base we one? we start indexing from zero. I mean like when you're loading up the index, you start with from one there on your diagram. So there's there's two counts here. <coughs> um the location of the words start from one. So this is location one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. But but this this um, location of which which asks me where the the nth occurrence is right this instant number this is indexed from zero so the first occurrence is indexed zero the second is one and so on so these numbers start from one. But for instance of, this would be instance of 0, 1, 2, and then 3 or higher would give me an error. Negative 1 would give me an error. If process file has not been run successfully, return minus 1. If the word is not in the process file, return minus 1. If the instance number is too small or too large, return minus 1. So that's like our universal error flag. Uh, number of words tells me the number of unique words in the file. So if this was our whole file, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, number of words would return seven. If you haven't processed the file, what do you return? Minus one. Sorry, return null. Uh, so no, return minus one. If process file has not been successfully run. All right, two string. This is the fun one. Two string returns the contents of your hash table. And so you're going to get back a string that has all of this information in it. And it's going to look something like this. It's going to be something like this. I don't know what the format is, but it's going, it's going to have a key and a list of values, a key and a list of values, a key and a list of values, and so on, all inside curly brackets. But you don't have to build that, okay? You're just going to return the two-string method uh, of your uh, hash table. And so we'll take a look at some sample code in a minute and see what that is. But it's a nice sort of one-line synopsis of all the words that are in your file and the locations where each word occurred. Curiosity, shouldn't we um, set 
set up a hash table in the constructor. Like, like obviously declare it outside of the constructor, but set it up as that variable equals a new hash table. You could, but you're going to need to do that inside process file also, because if process file is called five times on five different files, you need to start with a new hash table each time. Oh, okay, I see the indexer was its own object. For right. Each time you call it. So, this is going to be required to process five files at once or one at a time? Um, I could call process file, you know, three times on the same indexer object. I probably wouldn't, but you could. Okay, so indexer is its own object. The process file is just going to give you a new hash table for that specific document. Right, right. Okay, so we want to have a list of the hash tables, right? No, if, if you call process file again, you can forget about the previous process file's result. It's only going to contain one file, yeah. If I call process yeah. file again, my hash table contains the data for that file, and that's all that's in my in my object. Yeah, just, you still have to declare the hash table outside of the constructor and everything, right? Right, right. So declare the hash table as, as a, a global inside the class, um, and then construct it inside process file. You don't... Well, you probably want to constructor anyway. You might give it a file. Or... Uh, you can't you can't pass a file to the constructor, so. Oh yeah, so yeah, you don't even need a constructor. Yeah, you don't need to actually write it. <laughs> All right, let's let's um let's run some sample code on this, and then we'll go into the the internal details. Um, So there's there's um, a few pieces up here on the server. There's PA2 test and there's indexer.class. So let me copy those two. Um, into my, my home directory. So PA2 test, this is just sample code. This is very wordy sample code. This is the code that you'll see in the assignment. And this does a bunch of error checking. I'll probably use this as one of the main programs I run your indexer against. Um, but it's, it's very kind of chatty. So we construct a new indexer. And then without calling process file, right, I'll take a look at what the indexer is equal to. So I'll try to take the hash map and, and see that value. I'll see how many times the word test occurred. I'll see where the, the occurrence one of, of test was. I'll see how many words we're in the input file. All of these I'm calling without having run process file. That's an error, right? So these should do things that indicate, you know, to the caller that there was an error, but they shouldn't blow up, they shouldn't print anything. So this should return null, this should return uh, minus one, I believe. This should return minus one, and this should return minus one. Um, and then I'll call process file with a file that does not exist. And I'll, I'll look at the status from process file, which should be false, right? So I'm saving the return value from process file. And same thing, make sure it doesn't blow up on these. And then I call process file with a good file named testfile.txt. And, and, um, and then I'll print out the status, which should be true. I'll print out the actual hash table. Um, I'll look for something that's not in there, like bad, bad, bad. I'll look for the word test and so on and so forth. So, um, let me run this thing on itself. So, testfile.txt is now a copy of the source code for pa2test.java. Um, let's compile this, and I have the indexer.class. This is the thing you're going to write and compile to get your indexer.class, but you have a sample of the class file sitting here already. Please don't decompile it, because um, that's harder than writing the code. Um, so let's run PA2 test. And, um, you know, the index was null when I didn't build anything, and my things that return integers returned minus one as my flag. 
processed a bad file and returned false and minus ones. And then I processed a good file and the status was true. So if I print out the two string method of my index, this is what I get. And it's telling me, you know, all the words that it found in my file, which happened to be in my program. So static occurred at position 12, right? So where, where is static? Um, So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, position 12, that's where static occurs. And that's the only place it occurs in the entire file. So, so I lost it. But static was in here and it said it was at position 12. Um, all appeared at a position 110. System out print line occurred at position 127. Um, and, and you know this is a goofy thing to do on a java program because since we're ignoring punctuation right this was system.out.print line before right it sees that as one word this is system.out.print line before it sees that as one word um and so so system.out.print line before right here this occurred at positions 25, 28, 33, and 38. The word 4 appeared at positions 3 and 118, and so on. All right, so that's, that's the behavior of, of, um, of the program. So here's my, my new test file dot text, which I'm mimicking after, you know, this test file that, that we started with. This is a test, 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 it is done, this is all. Um, so let's see what happens if we run our program against this test file. So here's, here's the index that it created. So the word a uh, appears at position three, right? Which was what we found for a. Uh. The word this should be at positions one and 10. And here's this, it's at 10. Why didn't it appear at position one? I might've typoed, um, I did typo. All right, this appears at positions one and 10. Is should be at positions 2, 8, and 11. Um, there's 2, I missed 8 right there. 2, 8, and 11, and so on and so forth. And so this line right here is coming out when I simply say the following. I'm printing out um, after processing good file ind equals and I'm just appending the index right ind where ind was was you know the indexer that I constructed up here so the two string method of of this indexer class should return this so curly bracket um, contained list with a word equals and then inside square brackets comma separated list of locations this by the way comes from the two string method of a linked list and this comes from the two string method of a hash map which is using the linked list two string method to print out what's on the right of each equal sign so this is like classes playing together well All right, so that's that's the overall view of, of PA2. That's, that's an example of it on paper. That's an example of it running in code. 
Um, these are the public methods you need to implement. Process file is the real workhorse. Um, and then there's a pair of private methods you need to implement. One is called cleanup word. It takes a word as a string, returns a string, which is the cleaned up version. And how do you clean it up? Use character.isLetter. It's a static method in the character class. You put a character in here and it returns a boolean. So how do we do this? Initialize a new word to be just an empty string. Um, Iterate over each character. I'm assuming we're converting word. We're cleaning up word. So iterate over each character in here. So go from 0 up to word.length minus 1. And um, you can say character C equals word dot character at index I. So character at is a method inside the string class that gives you the ith character in that word. So if we iterate i from 0 to the last character position and we do character add i, this will be each character of your input word one at a time. And then if c is a letter, then new word equals new word plus c. And at the end of all of this, just return new word. There's your whole cleanup, and that's probably the longest method in the whole thing. So loop over your words, characters for each character. See if it's a, a um, this should actually be, um, well, in the beginning, uh, make word uppercase. So there's a, a two uppercase method in the string class also. And so you can say word equals word dot two uppercase. Make it uppercase and then go through, pull off each character. If it's a letter, append it to your output string and then return your output string at the end. So that's your cleanup word method. And keep in mind that your word could be empty when it comes back. For example, if I find the word one, two, three in my input file, well, none of those are letters, so when I convert that using this kind of cleanup method, I'm not going to append anything to my return string, I'm going to return an empty string. That's totally possible, it's totally, totally legitimate. But if I get back an empty string, don't try to add that to your hash. Because we don't want a tally of empty strings in the index, so just ignore it. One more private method called add reference, and add reference is really the workhorse. It's the thing that does all the work. And it's probably two lines of code. Right? But this is this is the thing that actually makes the whole shebang work. So what does add reference look like? It takes a word and a location and it adds that information to the hash table. So if I were to if this is my my linked list right now and I say add reference Um, all comma 14. What should happen when this method runs is it should put a 14 right here. Right, find the word all, there's a linked list, put a 14 on the end. And if I say add reference bunny comma 15, the end result of that is I should have a new word in my hash called bunny with a linked list containing a single number, which is 15. So add reference, that does all the work. Why not just do that in the process file? Well, process file is going to use add reference to do that, but I want you to break it out into a separate method. Deal. Cool. So this, this makes process file pretty simple, right? Open up your file, read a word, clean it up, add a reference. 
read the next word, clean it up, add a reference. So it's just a, a little while input file dot has next. Read the next line, clean it, add it as a reference. All right, so you're going to have one field in at least one field in your class named index that should be private, no access from outside. It's an object of type hash map. We're going to talk about hash maps after break. All right, so how do you do this? So I already I already did the spoiler a minute ago. So to process a file, open it using a scanner. We'll talk about how to do that on a file. If an error occurs, just return false. You're done. Construct a hash map named index. The keys are strings. The values are linked lists of integers. Have some local variable. I'm calling it a position counter. Initialize it to zero. Now go into a loop. As long as your scanner has a next token, get the next token. Clean it up with clean up word. And, and assuming the word is not empty, increment the position counter and then just call add reference with that cleaned up word and the incremented position counter and it'll add it to your hash. On the end of the file, close the scanner and return true. Your process file method is done. All right, um, add reference basically does these two steps that I described before. When you call add reference and you give it a word, first look in your hash table to see if that word is found. If it is, get the linked list associated with it, add the reference number to the end of the linked list. And since the linked list has an add method, just use that linked list's add method. But if instead you're inside add reference, you've got a word, you search your hash table and you don't find that word, now construct a new linked list containing this one number and then store that word and linked list pair into your hash. And you do that with a put method. And we'll do some sample hash map code and you'll see get and gets and puts. All right, and a reminder here, cleanup can be a simple uh, single loop that builds a string based on a character by character examination. Look at character at to uh, pull off the nth character and look at is letter to see whether or not that character is a letter. And I didn't mention it in here, but, but um, the string class has this two uppercase method, which returns the uppercase version of the string. So do that in the beginning. All right, there's a sample code that's available on the server, um, tempPA2test.java, but write your own your own sample code um, to drive this and develop this in pieces, right? Don't just try to write the whole thing and then run this test file. This test file is horribly confusing. Um, build it up one step at a time and test it as you go so that when you feel like you're done, you've already tested everything, you're convinced everything works, and then you can run it against this and you should see um, the same output that you're seeing here. But don't try to debug it for the first time by, by expecting this output and, you know, getting something else and trying to understand the differences. Because then you're trying to understand this main program and so on and so forth. Alright, grading. Um, you're going to submit this as a tar file. It's going to have a single class indexer.java. That's the only thing that should be in, in that tar file. Um, so if I can download and compile your, your indexer.java, you got 20 points, right? So that's good. Um, if, if, um, if you named your class indexer, you get an extra five points. So now you got a quarter of your points. Um, if process file will, will read in the file and clean up some words and store them in a hash map, that's 10 points. Even if it does nothing else, even if it throws in random numbers or there's no linked list or anything like that, if it pulls in the words, cleans them, and stores them in a hash map, you get more points, right? So this is this is increasing levels of, of functionality, right? And in some sense, you know, you can you can sort of maybe use this as a map for how you want to develop um, your code. Um, if it if process file also creates a linked list and stores that with each word and has at least one location for each word that's five points so so if you know maybe 
I've got the first location of each word, but that's it. You still get a few points for that. Um, if it manages to save all of the locations in each linked list, that's an extra five points. Um, and then um, your public methods, two string number of words, number of instances, location of, five points each if they're perfect. If there's any issues with those, you don't get the five points on them. Um, correct handling of um, what you do in these other methods. If process file does not succeed, that's worth five points. Um, the two private methods in the form that they're specified with those signatures, with those behaviors, 10 points total, five points each. And then 15 style points, three points for having your full name, the class number, and the date in the beginning of indexer.java. Three points for having the entire class described in a comment block in your own words. The indexer class reads a file, builds an index of word locations, and allows access to it, blah, 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 right? three points. Um, consistent indenting, placement of braces, and so on, the usual style points, three points for that. Um, all of your code commented, which means almost every line of code should have some comments on it. It's not unusual with object-oriented code to have a single line of code and a paragraph of comments describing what that line does. Because we are using, you know, a single line that might Take a word, look it up in a hash map, pull out the linked list, add something else to the end of the linked list, right? That can be one statement in Java. And there can be, you know, several things going on. So I want to see comments on every line. Um, if you say, you know, position count plus plus, tell me why you're incrementing position count. Don't just say add one to position count or increment position count. Um, you know, what does position count for? What's, what's the reason for incrementing it here? Um, keep track of, of where each word occurs, something like that, right? So I want to see lots of comments. Um, my, my only um, concern with a lot of the PA1B code that I saw, almost no comments in a lot of them. Some of them had zero comments. Some of them, um, about half of them, did not have a name anywhere in sight. Um, a lot of people commented their main, uh, class, but most people had no comments in their my stack or my queue class, and those are entire classes, right? If, if those were something that, that you downloaded from Oracle, um, you'd expect something, you know, with this much information in it. Now, they're simpler classes than these, but still, they've got, you know, some methods and some behaviors and so on, so lots of comments. And then each method, I want a comment before the method telling me what that method does. You've only got a few methods in there, right? Um, but put a, a block of comments. It can be one sentence if you can describe it in one sentence. But tell me what the method does, what the arguments are, what the return value is, what the side effects are, what the assumptions are, what the possible um, unusual conditions are, and so on and so forth. And really think of this as a class that you're going to, you know, put out on the web and people are going to download it and if they have any problems or questions about it they're going to call you up at 2 a.m. and say hey what am I supposed to pass to this method you know and so put your documentation in here to avoid those 2 a.m. phone calls so that's that's a mindset you can have all right recommended approach you've heard all of this before but let let me go through it with respect to this assignment right Start with, with a simplified indexer class. Just make a class indexer, right? It gets you away from the empty canvas. Class indexer, curly bracket, curly bracket. Boom, you've got something to build on now, right? Um, make a process file method. And maybe for starters, right, just have it open a file, read in each word, print out each word, right? That's significant. But it gets you through, you know, your first method. You've got you've got a process file method you can build on. You've got, um, you know, your scanner and your file and so on and so forth. You've got your try catch block, etc. So, so start from there. Um, and you know, for the first few steps, maybe keep your test file something something like this, all uppercase, no punctuation, you know, single space in between. Um, 
and don't worry about cleaning up the input yet because cleaning the input is is kind of a, a 224 level algorithm right we got to do it in java we've got to use different methods but algorithmically right it's just a for loop and a conditional you know append something to something else um and then make a hash map like i say we're going to do hash maps and scanners right after break um, make a hash map and save the words and just store them in your hash map as keys don't worry about what value you put in next to them put in a zero or something right but if you do that you can build this hash map in memory and then print it out at the end right after you're finished processing the file just call the hash maps to string method and you should get at least you know a comma separated list of of unique words inside curly brackets and then go on and start making the linked lists so now each time that you store something in the hash map make a new linked list, store that in there. And again, don't worry about putting anything in the linked list, just get the syntax down, get it to where it will compile, so that now next to each word in my hash table, I've got a linked list. And now, you know, count the, the location of each word, so each time you call has next, increment some position counter, and tack that onto the end of the words linked list. And then you're pretty much, you know, on the road to being done right you've got most of of your process file done now you can go ahead and clean up your input word and you know you can develop this and test it in isolation nothing to do with pa2 but once that's working right just go ahead and put that inside your loop before you start taking the word and looking in the hash map clean it up and then write a few methods to return the value from different methods in your hash map the size method to tell you how many words there are, um, the get dot link list dot size to tell you how many occurrences of a certain word occurred, and so on and so forth. Um, deal with the two string method, which is really just returning the hash maps to string. It's just like returning the the link lists to string when you wrote the my stack to string, right? So that's a wrapper, and then pick up those last edge cases so that if you don't succeed in processing the file you return minus one instead of you know throwing an exception if someone tries to call the um, the size method on the hash map and so on and then make sure that the comments which you've been writing all along right um, make sure those are all meaningful and everything is in place and so on and so forth and then do your final testing right and after you upload the tar file download it copy it to an empty directory untar compile run your tests and you're done. All right, and the bell is tolling. Um, so let's take a five minute break. And then um, if there's any questions that pop up about this, we can talk about those. And then I want to um, play with scanning from a file and looking at hash maps and get through some of the mechanics of, of those, um, those classes. And then uh, you should be good to go. So let's go ahead and come back at 14.36. And I'll see you in about four and a half minutes.
All right, we're back. Um, so let's let's talk about scanning from a file. So let me hop back on. Uh, let's see. Okay, Nick, out of curiosity, the uh, try catch block in the process file mm -hmm. should simply be around the scanner, right? That should just be around the scanner, yeah. I think that's the only thing that might go wrong. Because if you can read in a file, then it will, it'll just work. Sorry, my daughter's talking in the background. That's okay. If it, can't, if it can't read the file, it would just throw an exception right there, right? Right, After right. If already read the file, everything should work properly. I think so, yeah. I think if you can open it and, and get back that scanner object, then you should be able to read it. Right, right. That makes sense. It's interesting. This is the only language I've ever seen that have that behavior. Well, except except for the universe, right? So so at the hardware level, at the machine language level, there's something that will that will happen if an exception occurs. Um and and so normally, you know, we just kind of defer to the operating system or maybe the underlying hardware. But ultimately, you know, there is there is a handler declared somewhere. Um, but then, like everything between there and and higher level languages, just kind of let those exceptions fall out to whatever, unless you decide to, to trap them or catch them. Um, so yeah, but it's interesting that it's required um, in Java. So let's let's create a scanner object. I'm gonna, I'm gonna call it. I'm not gonna call it SC. That's what I've always called my scanners. Um, input file. How's that? Um, so uh, we're gonna create a new scanner, and we're going to pass to the constructor instead of saying system dot in to read from standard in. We're going to create a new file object. And the constructor to the file class is going to be the path name of the file that we want to read. So let me just read from test.txt. And that's all I need. All right, so... Um, If you look at the scanner class, it's got a number of different ways you can construct. Um, so, so the first way is to pass it a file, right? Um, but you can also pass an input stream. That's what system.in is. You can pass it a path, which is a different type of object. You can pass it a string, which will actually scan from a particular string. So you can do something equivalent sort of to sscanf to take a string and, and break it up into tokens. And, and we mostly use the scanner for its, its has next line and next line methods, or in this case, has next and next. Um, but it has all of these other methods, like, like reading the next boolean, the next byte, the next double or float, the next integer, the next integer in some radix, and so on and so forth. So you can kind of use this the way we use sscanf, thank you, to take a string and, and say, you know, is this... Um, you know something that contains a uh, floating point number in the beginning and so on, but we're we're gonna mainly use it in in PA two for the next method, which returns the next token, um, which which is for us things separated by spaces, and we're gonna use has next to tell us if there is a next token available, um, 
but but for some of these other things right these different types of constructors might make sense so we're going to construct with a file and what's a file well it's another type of class and how do you construct a file object well you can pass it a um a path name as a string and that's going to be the easiest for us to do so in this case my string is just test.txt that's going to be a file in my current directory I'm going to construct a new file I'm going to construct a scanner and so if I try to compile this um, where am I I will get our favorite error which is oh our second favorite error so um, if you go on the top of any of these classes you can see java.io.file that's the, uh, the package you have to import So now we get our favorite error, which is which is um, uncaught exception. So we could get a file not found exception. And so we're going to put this this scanner construction into a try catch block. Um, and I'm going to be a little sloppy here, and I'm just going to catch any exception. Input fickle um, and return. And so this should compile, should be happy with that. And it's not going to do anything very obvious. Well, it's going to do something really nice actually, because I don't have an input file in here called test.txt. So test.txt. See how many typos I can get in one file. Um, so now, if I run it, um, it doesn't do anything noticeable. It opens a f file through the scanner, and that's it. So let's let's make a loop and do this this business of reading in one word at a time. So while input file dot has next, we'll do word equals input file dot next. And I'll print out the word inside angle brackets as usual. There's the end of my input loop. And I'll close my file just to be polite about things. Um, and closing your scanner will close the file. And it's not strictly necessary on Linux, but on some operating systems if somebody opens a file even for reading and somebody else tries to open it they will um, they'll get an error and so we're gonna close these I guess I clicked through from my scanner method so scanner has a close method all right so let's let's um See how we did here. Hey, there we go. There's the words in our file. All right, so that's that's pretty much all you need from the scanner for um for um processing. Um so so 
Um, someone asked a question for PA2. Are we going to use args bracket zero for the name of the text file? There is no specified name of the text file in this assignment. And this is, this is a subtle but important point, right? You are creating the indexer class, and the indexer class's process file method takes as an argument a file name. But you're not submitting a main program. Now, when you're writing a test program, you could hardwire the name you're going to pass to process file. You could just, you know, process file test.txt. Or you could make a main program that takes, you know, args bracket zero, the first command line argument, and passes that as the file name to process file. And then you could, you know, test this file, test that file, test some other file. Um, that's all fine. But, but for the indexer class itself, this is just a, a argument to the process file. And all the stuff that you do, constructing the scanner and so on, you use this file name. All right, let's make this thing slightly more incredibly fancy. Um, let me start off with a position equal to 1. And when I print out the location of the word, um, I'm going to also print out next to the word where its position is in the file. And after this, I'm going to increment position. And with that one small change, I've got the beginning of my PA2, right? Because now I'm pulling in these words and I know where they are in my input file. Well, all I got to do is pass this to clean up and then pass the cleaned up word and this position to add reference and I'm done. So top down design is always cool. If you can get the, uh, the job of writing the main program, you can finish in like 15 minutes, go out and play golf the rest of the day or something, right? Top down, the higher levels of the program in some ways do the least amount of work. Because they just say, hey, take that, clean it up. Hey, take that, add that to the hash table. Hey, print out the hash table, right? And then it's these lower level routines that have to actually go out and like go through the hash table and find the hash function and deal with collisions and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's, um, it's a good match to think of things in terms of top down design when you're working with objects. Not always. Sometimes we'll go bottom up, but um, we don't know where the bottom is, right? Because for us, the hash map class has a bunch of, of the bottom level routines, the lowest level routines. The linked list has some lower level routines. So it kind of makes sense to start from the top and work your way down. And so, so for this assignment, um, you know, process file is that main program we just wrote with some calls to clean up Word and add reference. And, and it's pretty much that simple. ToString just returns index.toString. Number of words just returns index.size. We're going to look at hash maps in a minute. Location of takes a word, looks it up in the hash map, gets a link list, and then uses the link list method for finding where a word occurs. Or, you know, pulls out the, the nth word by using a get method. Uh, let's see, cleanup word. Hmm, hadn't thought about using for each on that. Um, yeah, cleaning up a word is really just, it can be a for loop just over each character in the word. Again, don't don't make the, the mistake of reading in all of your words and turning them into a big long string and then trying to iterate over that. Because I can almost guarantee I'll, I'll make your code blow up on some of the big test files. Um, so process one word at a time. All right, so that's, that's an example of using a scanner on, on, a, um, on a file. And the, the only real difference is you gotta have a try catch block and you have to construct the scanner with a new file from the name of, of the path.
And if, if you don't do this, if you do this instead, right, you just construct the scanner with the name of your file instead of creating a new, a new file object, you get this very sad result. Right? It scans the argument you used to construct the scanner, which was a string test.txt. It doesn't actually open the file. It just scans this string literally. So we want to actually open the file. All right, questions about that? All right, let's talk about hash maps. Um, do I have a hash map up here still? Oh, I got an abstract map. Hash map. All right, so hash maps are, are Java's implementation of associative arrays. So being able to have two sets of things and we associate something from this set with something from that set. And the nature of these two sets of things can be pretty much anything. So this is a generic class. We have to specify when we create a hash map what types of things constitute the keys and what types of things constitute the values. So key is sort of the index we use to look something up and value is the thing associated with that key. So key value pairs is a term you'll hear a lot with hashes. Um, and so these, these are generic and we specify K and V inside angle brackets when we declare and construct hash maps. Um, so let me put this into a new file. And we're going to use java.utility.hashmap. We don't need our file. This is a hash map example. Here's main three. Uh, what should we call our hash map? Somebody give me your favorite name for a hash table. Hash browns. Hash browns. All right. So this declares a hash table called hash browns. It does not construct it yet. So if I were to try to do anything with this, it's null. I'll probably get a null pointer exception. Um, the constructor for a hash map can be empty. We can also specify the initial size, how many cells we have in, in the array. We can also specify a load factor, which is how full the hash has to get before it automatically rehashes. But we'll construct with just an empty constructor. Um, but we're going to have to specify types. So let's um, use strings and integers. So the keys will be strings or words, and the, the values will be integers. Is it an uppercase M? It is. New hash map. All right, and, and note the syntax, right? Hash map angle bracket parameters is, is a single thing, right? This is a hash map of this, this type of key and value. So when we declare, we say all of that in the name of the, the object. When we construct, we say new, this thing, and then parentheses and any arguments that we have. So let's store some data into our hash. So there's a put method, it takes a key and a value, and it stores it into the hash table. So, um, so we can say hash browns dot put um, scattered comma 12. So I'm taking this word scattered and I'm associating the number 12 with it. 
and I'm going to put a word in here, chunked, and I'm going to associate negative 189 with that. And I'm going to put the word diced, and I'm going to associate the name, the number 42. All right, so I'm storing data into this associative array. These are the indexes I'm using, the indices, and these are the values I'm storing with each index. And so let's read some data. And so um, there's a get method, which takes a key and returns a value. So this is how we retrieve from, from a hash map. And so we can say hash browns dot get um, quote scattered. And if we try to get diced, we can do that. And if we try to um, get the word topped, that's not in our hash. So that should come back with something different. So what does the get method do? It returns the value to which the specified key is mapped, or null if this map contains no mapping for that key. So scattered diced should return their values, 12 and 42. Top should return null. Bragging rights if anybody knows where I'm getting these keys from. Look at all them errors. Wow. That's impressive. Nine errors and three warnings. I'm good. Um, so I've got some underscores in there. That's getting it all kinds of upset. Um, I'm going to get rid of those and see what happens. Down to three errors. Um, so you got to make sure you uppercase things that need to be uppercased. So there we go. All right, so let's run this, right? So scattered map to null, dice map to 42, topped map to null. I think I misspelled scattered. Um, It did. All right, scattered should map to 12. So run this, scattered maps to 12, dice maps to 42, top maps to null. So we've, we've got an associative array. And in this case, the things that we're storing in there are integers, but they could be linked lists. And the only difference would be when we declare and construct the hash map, instead of saying integer, we would say link list, and we'd actually say link list angle bracket integer for a link list of integers. And then when we add something, when we put something, instead of putting an integer here, we put a link list. Typically a new link list angle bracket integer. And then when we get, what we would get back, instead of being an integer, would be a link list. And that linked list we get back, we could do something like call its add method by saying hash browns dot get parentheses key close paren dot add parentheses argument to the add. So we can chain all this stuff together. Uh, so you, you can get the, basically the name of the linked list could just be the um, get with the keyword? Mm-hmm, yep. You don't even need to save it into a, a local variable. But you want to make sure it's not null. Because if it's null, you'll probably throw a null pointer exception. So, so let's just continue this kind of silly demo. Let's go ahead and store some data for top. Um, or do you just put, if it's already a string, you just put word or whatever your variable and name Any is. kind of string will do. 
as long as the object you put in there is a string. So it could be double quotes or it could be an, an object declared to be a string. Or it could be, you know, a method that returns a string. Um, it should all work the same. All right, so we'll we'll put one, two, three, four, five into topped. And so first topped was null, and now it maps to one, two, three, four, five, and and we can change what dice associates with. So let's change dice to. something new and then let's make sure that that actually took All right so so it's it's truly an associative array right I can I can put a new value to be associated with diced and it overwrites the old value that I associated with it right so this is this is good hash table behavior And finally, let's take a look at the toString method. So let's just print out hash browns equals, and let's just append hash browns. And so hash browns equals, and inside curly brackets, we see this comma separated list of key value pairs. No particular order, right? So, so I added scattered, chunked, and diced, and they're stored as chunked, diced, and scattered. And this is, you know, what you saw when you implemented a hash table last quarter using an array. The mapping from a key to where it's stored in that array is more or less, you know, pseudo-random. It's based on the hash function. So the key goes through some kind of hash function which determines inside the hash map class where this thing is going to be stored and it gets stored there. And so when you iterate, when you try to pull out, you know, the contents of your hash, um, the order is, is more or less, you know, unpredictable. It's certainly not going to come out in the same order that you put things in. Um, all right, have a good one. Um, and so that's, that's, you know, expected behavior for hashes. And this is a really good, um, a really good time to sort of take a breath and think about abstract data types, right? Because you've implemented hash tables and you know about, you know, hash functions and probing and chaining and collisions and delete flags and all of that business, right, that you had to do to create a hash table, all that stuff is still happening, but it's completely obscured from our view, right? We don't see that. Um, it, it doesn't pop up anywhere, but some of that stuff is happening somewhere. Where is it happening? It's happening inside these methods. But those details are, are very deliberately hidden from us. They're on the other side of this firewall I keep speaking about that separates the caller from the implementation. So as an abstract data type, what is a hash map? It's a collection of key value pairs that we can interact with using these different methods. But is this using probing or is it using chaining? No idea. I have an idea, but you know, it's immaterial. Um, how big is the underlying array? What is the nature of the hash function that it's using? How many cells are in the underlying array? No idea doesn't affect us, right? We don't want to be thinking about those details when we're trying to use a hash table. We want to say construct, put, get, right? That's our interface to, to the hash table. Here's a key, store it with this data. Here's a key, give me the data that's stored with it. That's what we really care about. And, and the code in these methods takes care of all of those details. And so, for example, there's, there's this notion of a load factor, right? 
where where as things are added to the hash table it becomes more and more full and if it exceeds some threshold um, the system will automatically um, rehash so you know default load factor is three quarters and when when three quarters of the space is filled it expands the space for us automatically right so the hash table is rehashed um, so that it approximately doubles in size but that's that's immaterial to us we just say put we say get we're happy right so so we would not want to have to do things like say is the hash table full how full is it if, if it's too full then let's call the rehash function and expand the size of the hash table we don't want to deal with that stuff right but if this was just a set of methods, a set of functions that we called in C, right, we might have to expose those, those aspects to us. So by putting all of this in, in a separate class, right, that can contain all of that code as well as the data, the array, and, and, and so on, um, it's, it's just this thing that we call an object that we just, you know, say put and get, and everything else kind of happens. So that's really the idea of... of working in an object-oriented language is to take all of that capability and put it inside this one object this thing we call hash browns and and not have to you know know about other functions we have to call and pass arguments and things like that so this is this is a really nice kind of, of point to think about abstract data types all right and this is pretty much all you need for hash maps to do PA2 Right, you need to to um, initialize it inside your process file. Um, you need to be able to um, store link lists associated with words, and you need to be able to look for link lists. And you can do that by just saying get. And if get returns null, then that word is not in your hash. If it does not return null, the word is in your hash, and what it returned is the data you associated with it. And what data is that? It's a link list. Which so check? Like, uh, is the word in, or is there a linked list associated with that? Sure. Um, that should work fine. So, let's add the word bunny, which we found at location 12. Right? So, um, take your hash table. I'm just going to use strings here, but you know, this would obviously be a variable. So try to get that word bunny. Um, and I'm going to say, you know, list equals hash browns dot get bunny. If list is not null, I'm just going to add a 12 to the end of the list. Bingo, I've added another reference to bunny. If list is null, then um, list equals new linked list. All right, construct a new linked list, and then hash browns or list add 12, and then hash browns put key and a value. So you have to write, you know, Java functions and, and logic and stuff to make these things happen in general, but this these would be the steps that you'd want to do, right? See if bunny's in your hash table. If it is, just add your reference to the end of that linked list that's associated with it. Otherwise, make a new linked list, add your reference to the end of it, and then store that linked list in your hash table associated with that word. Right there yep. In, in the put. Yeah, you could put bunny comma new linked list. And then you would just have to do. And then you have to do this thing again. Add. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Perfect. Cool.
All right. So this this is this is the point that you need to kind of like scratch your head over usually. Um, and and when you see it and you do it and it works, right? It's usually a big light bulb moment. And it, it really kind of connects the idea of, oh, these are objects, these are self-contained entities and so on. But until then, this, this may feel weird, right? Um, the weird feeling is your hint that like, this is what you wanna be, be hitting your head against, right? There's, there's something here that needs to be conceptualized, basically. Scattered, smothered, chunked, diced, and topped. Five of the topping options for hash browns at Waffle House. But they've added some others since then. And they claim there's like 23 million combinations, but I, I back of a napkin did once and it's nothing close to that. <laughs> you want to know something insane I learned the other day about What's that? Waffle House? Fun side fact. Okay. There's actually a legitimate hurricane index called the Waffle House Index. Really? Because of how... <laughs> How destructive a storm is, they compare it to how Waffle Houses are always open. It's an actual index. That makes Waffle sense, Waffle yeah. Index. They're up and down the coast and they're 24 hours, so that's that's an excellent uh, metric. I'll have to look that up. All right, cool. That's a great place to end today. Um, so I think you've got all the pieces you need for PA2. That's everything you need to know about hash maps and scanners. Um, so I, I would go ahead and work on that. Do your ODP, of course. Um, um, bring questions to class on Thursday or office hours Thursday morning. Um, but you should be in good shape. So if you have a chance, go ahead and jump into that and uh, see how far you can get. And um, have fun with it because, like I say, once you kind of get past the, um, the, the mental hurdle of, of, you know, what is an object... It starts to be really fun. It's it's these big, large building blocks you can just kind of pick up and pile on top of each other, and and bingo, you're done. All right, I'm out of here. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Um, stay safe, and I will see you all next time. Bye. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks. Thank you for your lectures. Have a good day. Thanks you too.